Hello, everyone. My name is Leal, and I'm very excited to be welcoming you to today's fireside chat on financial inclusion. I'm the executive director of FinTech Cadence, and I'm here to discuss financial inclusion and how to help Canadians through paytech and fintech. As some of you may already know, FinTech Cadence was founded in 2017. At the time, our stakeholders were working in silos, which impeded the startup's potential for growth. With the goal of stimulating collaboration, FinTech Cadence has brought together talent, startups, universities, researchers, VCs, incubators, and accelerators, as well as financial institutions to work together, innovate together, and help make the lives of Canadians better. On that note, and before I introduce our fireside chat guest today, I'm very excited to also launch our call for applications with Desjardins Startup and Residence Program, where they are specifically looking for pay techs that are helping make the lives of Canadians better. So if you are a pay tech and you're interested or able to support this mission, then I encourage you to look at our website and find out more information. But within that spirit and how we understand the importance of inclusion and innovation, I welcome Keith Martel, President and CEO of First Nation Bank of Canada, to delve more into this topic and on how we can deliver accessible financial services to communities. Welcome, Keith. Good morning. Good morning. So we're going to get started right away. Fireside chat. So we will we'll try and get as much information from you as possible. For those who might not be very familiar with the First Nations Bank of Canada, can you help us understand what markets you're currently serving and what make, what is unique about those markets? Sure, that, that's a good question. We aren't we aren't a household name in banking in Canada, in mainstream Canada although we are extensively uh, doing business in Indigenous Canada, and, and that's really our prime focus. Um, it's really important to understand who we are because that deals with the question of how we service our customers and, and my views on this issue of how we make sure we include them in any modernization of the payment structure and the financial service delivery in Canada. So we're a federally regulated chartered bank. We were created in 1996 by primarily First Nations in Saskatchewan, who saw that there was a disconnect between the needs of Indigenous communities that were growing and becoming more self-reliant and getting access to a lot of resources through claims and other, other means, resource developments in their communities, and, and the, the financial services they needed to continue that growth. So there was a disconnect there. So we were created uh, and, and to, to fill that need, and that's the primary reason we exist today. We focus on that market. Uh, we're owned primarily by uh, First Nations and Inuit shareholders, 87% of the banks owned by them. And we innovate and create products and services. Sometimes it's not high-tech products and services. It's, it's old world products and services that we create, but ones that were inaccessible to Indigenous communities. And if you understand the history of, of Indigenous communities and Indigenous peoples in Canada, you sort of get how there was a disconnect with financial institutions. It, it goes back to a few uh, fundamental sort of structural issues, especially with First Nations. So under the Indian Act, there's a section of the Indian Act meant to protect First Nations people and their property, but it really prevents financial institutions from taking physical or security on physical assets that reside on reserve, on reserve land for First Nations. And that really for a very long time was used as a reason why financial institutions didn't lend and, and primarily didn't really interact with many First Nations in Canada. That's not relevant to Métis or Inuit people, but in their case, a lot of them are remote. And so in, in you know, the same circumstances, if you have a truck in northern Nunavut, even though you can take physical security on a physical asset, it's so remote that realizing on your security is a problem. So it was very difficult for many Indigenous people, many Indigenous businesses and governments to really access credit and therefore any kind of you know, banking services at all. The other thing is that they had a very short history in dealing with financial institutions. You know, the rest of Canadians have been dealing with banks. You know, I, I live in Saskatoon. I've been dealing with a bank since I was a, a child because there was banks everywhere. There was financial services everywhere. When they were physical, now they're, they're more electronic, but they are still accessible. First Nations in Canada, under the Indian Act, didn't really control any of their financial resources until the early 80s which meant that effectively an Indian agent, a government employee was doing all the banking for the community. So when First Nations got access to their resources in the early eighties, my uncle was chief of our community. He went to banks to open up bank accounts because they now had to cut checks and pay suppliers and pay teachers and pay employees. 
And banks weren't even aware of how to create a bank account for a First Nation. Um, no articles of incorporation, no, none of the normal practices and processes that they could sort of fit in the box. And so First Nations were really not present in financial institutions until they started getting access to those resources. And then a lot of banks and financial managers wanted to access the you know, hundreds of millions of dollars that was coming into their control, but they still didn't want to lend to a local entrepreneur or open bank accounts for communities in remote locations where they couldn't physically be in a branch. So, so that created a, a, a niche that First Nations Bank was created to fill. Today, we serve primarily commercial customers by volume, but by number of accounts, a lot of individual customers. A lot of them are in north and remote locations that were underserved or unserved in the past. And that really is, is um, the way we do business. Like I said, innovation for us is not necessarily the, the latest technology delivery, but it's things like actually allowing people that aren't in a community where we have a physical presence to open a bank account. That's something we were one of the first banks to do that. And we used a lot of verification mechanisms to make sure we knew our client. We didn't violate any regulatory requirements, but we allowed people to create accounts because there was many northern communities where less than 30% of the adult working population had bank accounts because they had to take an $800 plane ride to go to a neighboring community to open an account, which just isn't feasible. So, so that, that's who we serve today. Um, you know, we, we try and innovate in a lot of ways with the, the way we deliver local services and the things that we, we put into communities that make banking possible. That's really fascinating, Keith, and I think it's really important to highlight a lot of those components that you mentioned, of which we've just taken for granted at the rest of Canada. And I think I really love the point where you're saying innovation is not necessarily about the newest technology, but fair access to the services that, like you said, has been guaranteed to other communities. So I think that's really incredibly enlightening. Um, and maybe on that note, and we're talking about technology, but, uh, you know, Payment Summit is heavily talking about modernizing payments. And so I'm very curious from your perspective, what do you see as the benefits of a modernized payment system for these Indigenous economies? And what are the challenges in, in achieving these benefits? Yeah, I, I actually think they have more to gain from the modernization of payments than any other Canadians, because... If, if my phone goes down and I can't use it to do financial services, I can walk a few blocks or frankly go downstairs to our own bank. Within a few blocks, I can go to you know 10 different physical locations to do something. In, in First Nations, Inuit, Métis communities that are north and remote, there's no such option. So I think they have the most to gain. If you look at the developing world, um, the introduction of good cell technology really allowed them to skip over the whole stage of wired phone service. And, and if you look at a lot of developing countries, their, their cell services and the things they do with it are much more advanced than countries who are still trying to shake themselves from wired, wired line services. And it's the same with Indigenous communities. I think we can do a lot for them. Um, you know, just access is a good example. We opened a community banking center in a community in Nunavut that had never had a financial institution present in that community. And while we were at there at the opening, I talked to a young single mother in the community who um, got child support from her, from her ex-husband who lived in another community. He mailed the check when it was due. She had to take that check, put it in another envelope when she got it, and mail it back to her financial institution. And people think, well, you just mail a check to a neighboring community. That's a week-long process. So it took a week for the check to come from him to her, another week for the check from, to come from her to her bank. And so she delayed having that child support services for two weeks, which, you know, it, it, when we opened the community banking center, it lowered her weight to one week. If we deliver financial services through technology, she might be able to do remote deposit capture, which she can do through our bank now, and then she's not waiting at all. And, and that's a really huge benefit for those kind of communities that aren't used to that kind of service delivery. And the, the, the real challenge, that. sorry, the real challenge though, is that is there's a couple of big challenges. The, the one is connectivity. Um, which is a huge challenge. I talked about that single mother in Nunavut. One of the problems she has with the remote deposit capture in her community is that the cell service and Wi-Fi time out before she can actually enter her, 
her password into her banking system. So she still relies on, on the physical presence we have in the community banking center and can't actually use a lot of the technology because it's got so many features and functions that the bandwidth in those communities is not sufficient to, to meet her need. And, and that's a challenge. And then the other thing is financial literacy. Many uh, people in some of those communities don't have that financial literacy to allow them to take advantage of a lot of the new products and services being delivered to their doors. And I think those are two really key um, challenges, especially in being able to leverage that uh, the, the, the components that we just talked about. I'm curious if you don't mind, Keith, to kind of explore, especially the financial literacy component, because that comes up quite a lot um, in fintech and how fintechs can actually help educate consumers or provide them with the literacy and the terminology and the capability of being able to say, okay, these are the services I need and these are the services that I don't. So I'm wondering, are there initiatives being done to educate consumers on how they can leverage these services? Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, if you don't know what's available and how to use it, then if, even if it's there, it's, it's of no use to you. And so financial literacy is key. And I think one of the things you have to remember about indigenous communities is that they don't have the same life experiences that many people in the South do. They, they don't have sometimes the language skills. There's many communities we deal in where the main language is a Nuktatuk or, or a Cree and, and people think and work in that language. And if all of the, the, the um, financial literacy training and everything is in English, and use the Southern examples, there's a, a financial literacy package that one of the government agencies was delivering to a Northern community, you know, and they talked about, you know, Sally getting a, a, an allowance and Sally going to a neighborhood bank and opening an account. None of that was relevant to the, to the Inuit people in that community. They, they read it, but they didn't comprehend any of it. So I think when you talk about that kind of use of technology, we have to remember that people have different languages that, that we can deliver that, that service in. They have different life experiences and we have to find relevant context so we can train them in those things. And the other thing is we have to reflect them, them in the technology. If all they're seeing is, is Southern kids and, and, and Caucasian people and they're not included, then they don't see themselves in that and they turn it off and they don't learn from it. So we, we spend a lot of time trying to indigenize the financial literacy so that it's acceptable and 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 taken up in the communities we serve. I love what you're saying, Keith. As a former educator, I think it's absolutely imperative that people are being taught in examples and in cases and in context that they know and they're familiar with. So I really am very excited to hear you say these things. I know at FinTech Cadence, we are very big advocates of that. And I really very much am looking forward to how you guys grow within that ecosystem and what you're able to do and, and where possible, where we can support, happy to do that as well. Um, maybe we have a little under a minute left. So maybe what I'll do is ask you our last part of questions. Although Keith, I could spend hours with you just hearing more about the work that you're doing and the realities of these different communities. Uh, but maybe I'll just wrap up with one last question around what message would you like to leave with those here today about the indigenous market in Canada? Uh, I, I think you, you know, from a business perspective, think about it the way we, we thought about it when we created First Nations Bank. There's a large market there. It's growing. It's very young. Its median age is far below the Canadian average. Um, it has access to vast amount of lands with vast amount of resources, and they're becoming really economic powerhouses in many of the regions where communities have started to develop. So there's a good market there. Don't compete with First Nations Bank. We, we, we have the market cornered, but there's lots of room to do lots. And we cooperate with many other financial institutions to deliver the kind of services that are needed. But the other thing you have to remember is just what I said in the last segment is that their needs are slightly different. And you know, just thinking about the connectivity thing, you can create the best connected service in the world, but if they can't access it, then it's, it's not really of much use to them. And, and we have to think that there's many Canadians all across this country who are not in the circumstances of a person living in downtown Toronto or downtown Saskatoon. And we have to realize that they, have the they need to have the opportunity to access these great, these great services that we're providing to them through electronic means. 
That's absolutely wonderful. So Keith, we'll make sure that no one competes with First Nations Bank of Canada. <laughs> but we'll also make sure that the conversations and support where possible and where relevant is also provided. I thank you so much for your time today on not only behalf of myself, but behalf of the audience. It was a pleasure to hear what you had to say and to see the work that you guys are doing. For our audience, please connect with us in, in, in any of the future chats and any of the rest of the sessions. And with that, I wish everyone a great rest of your summit. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.